Oh, look at all these beautiful faces. Oh, I love it. Love it. Love it. Um, I <laughs> can't hear any of you, but hopefully you can all hear me. Thumbs up if you can hear me. Good. Um, Janine, I have to just ask you, what is that painting behind you? Um, I actually don't know. I just know that um, at my job, we did, we're sort of doing some um, philanthropy work. And so we did a presentation on Friday. And so this was our united background that we used. Um, wow. uh, for our presentation. So uh, that's the last one I've had on here. I love that. That's so pretty. I really like that. It's eye catching. Yeah. You know, I, I know this is eye catching too, but yours <laughs> takes it to a whole nother level. <laughs> well, welcome. It feels like more than a month since we were together. I don't know why, but it really feels like a long time uh, and a lot lots going on lots going on on the planet lots going on for each of us personally it's good to see your faces um what i'd love for you guys to do is i always like to put time aside that i'm answering your questions directly when we have our enlightenment power groups our making discovery groups so um just start typing your questions in there and whatever the flow is i'm sure i'll probably get to some of it anyway without looking at it directly but put your questions in there because at some point i'll just say we're turning it over to your guides and any questions that you put in there or you can you know raise your hands and i'll call on people but this night is especially about you and uh, that's a great opportunity to hear exactly what your guides would like to tell you specifically um and of course in addition to that just chat in the chat room for questions you might have about anything we're talking about along the way. And as you well know, I'm getting really good at managing it so I can read along and, and, uh, and chat along with you and answer your questions. So, and hello, I see some hellos in the chat room, but no, none to me, they're just to each other. So hello to all of you saying hello to each other. But it is good to see you. And like I said, I don't know why it feels like a really long time since we were together. Uh, well, time seems to have less meaning lately anyway. So maybe we're entering into that quantum part of our physical journey here where there is no such thing as time and we're experiencing it in a weird way where some of us don't know when it's the weekend. We don't know what uh, day of the week it is. We don't know what time of day it is. I know I've had all of these challenges for many years already and you guys are finally catching up to me, which is you can blame the, the pandemic, but I just say it's a byproduct of enlightenment when you lose your relationship with time. So congratulations, all of you who no longer have a tight relationship with time. You are proudly enlightened. It's official. Okay. Yeah. Next, you're going to start losing your car keys. You'll no longer have a knack for technology. Uh, you'll find yourself daydreaming at the most inappropriate moments, but hey, congratulations on your enlightenment. And these are some of the wonderful byproducts of it. So welcome, welcome to my world. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, an interesting topic that your guides have selected for this evening is, um, I'll just write the word on the board to kind of, like get us all vested in the topic. Wow, cool. I wonder why I didn't put that in my promos because that would have really drawn everybody in because that sounds like a blast. <laughs> uh, well, I don't choose it. So you can blame your guides if you want to complain to anyone just go complain to your guides don't don't complain to me i didn't choose it uh, now in all seriousness i find this a fascinating topic because the, the time that we do have here with our consciousness in a human experience is it's just a moment and in our eternal journey it's a wisp of air here this breath that we're taking you know when we're not in our bodies anymore and we see the magnificent of this timeline of when we were this human being that we are um you know fully wearing wearing the clothing of it's it's an exciting part of our eternal journey but we get to understand 
when we return home, how brief it is in the scheme of things, it, not in time, um, not in time lapsed, because there's no such thing as time in the energy realm. It's more about the amount of energy that this comprised of in comparison to the amount of energy that we're expending in our eternal journey. So we get to see that it's not as massive as we think it is just simply because the entirety of our eternal journey is just so much more massive. And I know that ever since I've been communicating with the non-physical, it's been exciting to see how this slice fits into our eternal journey because it gives me, for one, far more comprehension of the day-to-day -day experiences that were happening, that are happening. And it helps me to process and step up to them in the proportion of energy that they should be allotted rather than the pre-me before um, communicating with guides where little things were lots of drama and big things were lots and lots and lots of drama. Now, things uh, that I might have ignored or seen as insignificant in the past of this earth life, now those seem more significant to me. And the stuff that uh, other people are getting spun around by, that just doesn't draw me in. It just doesn't, um, it's not enticing. It's not captivating. It's not, uh, there's no rush in it. Now I understand that me, like most people coming from um, a, a challenging upbringing, we, we tend to kind of feel the pulse of life when we are in turmoil. And it makes sense that we would be unknowingly addicted to turmoil because it's echoing a familiar pattern or state that we grew up with. But we're unaware that we're addicted to it, but it's, uh, it's difficult sometimes for many people to transition from the chaos of a rough and uh, chaotic childhood into a more calm, loving, peaceful, way of being in adulthood because it can be misinterpreted as boring. The challenge is that um, you have to pursue getting there because when you actually get there and you're not faking it, you realize that it's not boring, um, that peace and uh, boredom are not interchangeable synonyms. A calm that comes with this level of enlightenment does not bring on any kind of boredom at all. Matter of fact, what happens is the time that you used to give up with your energy to pursue uh, trauma and drama and negativity and uh, the life pulse that comes from uh, all, all of this stuff that we are doing, the energy that you used to devote to that can now be used for happy pursuits and when you find that you have that energy for happy pursuits you're actually not only happier because of an increase in enlightenment but you're also happier on top of happy because you're pursuing things that add to that already happiness so i don't see necessarily death as i think it's just gotten a bad name here we we make it we make it like death but it's really not. It's a, just a pause in consciousness until we return to our original consciousness. And I, I tend to even look at our own death as a birth moment. I don't really see it as a death because as soon as I am aware that somebody has separated from their body and you know, I had a client who lost someone today and you know we lost someone over the weekend and I, for me, immediately, I get, I get into the sense of how crystal clear that soul's viewpoint about the entirety of their life is and how liberating that must feel for them and how the, some of the intuitive stuff I might have known about their physical life and how the pieces fit together. I, I feel excited to have them you know, have that awareness as well. Uh, so I only feel kind of um, a sense of 
their liberty, a sense of their wholeness, a sense of comprehension of the things that happen that were disagreeable in this earth life and how they happen and why they happen and how they were never flawed and they were never at fault. And it was just the process of being human and living in the human experience where we often dial down our soulfulness because that's what we're modeled and that's what we experience, of course. So I see death as a birth. Now, if we had always in our collective uh, culture and, and globally, if we had always seen death as a, as a birth, the way that I do, and even I've heard of some tribes still see it as a birthday, a day of celebrating. If that were our perception, then even the word death wouldn't have any negative connotation. You know, if we said someone died or some um, after their death, or um, I'm afraid of dying, any of the time we use death or any derivative, those words wouldn't even have any negative connection or connotation to them. Am I correct? You know, like if you look at certain words and how they've morphed in the English language where they no longer mean what they had originally intended, you get to see that a word only has the meaning that we associate with it. And if we were to turn this around and everybody were to begin celebrating um, someone's death, then we would completely transform the vibration of that word. And it wouldn't become this black uh, hole that people are terrified of and holding themselves desperately on the outside of the hole, afraid that they're going to get sucked in. And so even coming at the word itself, now I know why guides had me write it on the board, because even when you look at the word itself differently, you get to see it only has the power over us that we assign to it. And what we assign to it is not just our version, and it's almost not our version at all. It's all of the people that have trampled the earth before us, their version, and we've opted in. So the first thing we can do is to um, see if we can privately uh, celebrate that experience of transition and start to see it more as a date of birth. Um, I got a private message and it contains a compliment. So I'm going to privately say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. You're not read in on it because it was private. Um, I appreciate your comment, Joan, that you, you, you wrote when I was happy when my dad um, passed in May, but you were wondering if there was something wrong with you. Um, that's exactly the kind of thing that I'm talking about. If there's been a collective agreement that if someone quote unquote is suffering at the end of their life and then they pass, you're allowed to be happy for them. That's about all we've gotten to in our agreement that it's okay. Um, so it is unusual for us to be able to share that we do feel a sense of celebration when someone transitions from this state of consciousness into the state of consciousness that we were at before we were born. Uh, but we have this private group and part of connecting with each other on a regular basis or even just being connected afterward by watching the video the next day, even if you're not participating online or in the chat room today. But you know that we have a commonality in wanting to continue to um, have a better, more meaningful understanding of life and death in a way that supports us instead of breaks us apart or breaks us down. And that's our goal. And so in our own private unit and things that we've shared in seminars and you know sessions that I've done with people and experiences we've had, especially something like when we went to Grenada earlier this year, what you know is that you have people that can have conversations that are experiencing the same kind of atypical experiences that you are and you can't commonly talk about it with anybody else because they will think that there's something wrong with you or they'll feel pity or whatever and to be like all right dear don't worry when when you do break apart um, i'll be here for you and you're just you're in a state of um, denial or you're just numb or don't worry it'll pass but it, they're trying to be compassionate they're trying to be helpful but 
really the only, the only, there's no such thing as a mistake, but the only mistake you made was telling someone who couldn't possibly comprehend what it is that you're experiencing. But I do, I do understand what you're experiencing. I also always at this point, if I am talking about death, I want to make sure that I remind us about the miracle of who we are specifically. And even if the vastness of our eternal journey makes this look like just a you know, piece of it that seems less energetic than what we are experiencing as we're traveling through it, it doesn't mean that we're dialing down the significance of this lifetime. This lifetime does matter. It is significant. And the originality and the uniqueness of you and every single experience you've had in this physical journey cannot be replaced. It cannot be recreated. It cannot be undone. It cannot be anything except what it is. And it is a miracle for each of us to be exactly who we are at this second. And I would not want to see that miracle expire before the moment of your rebirth when it's exactly appropriate on all levels, okay? Um, okay, so let's continue. I want to start with an interesting happening that happened earlier today and um, so appreciative of having a group that's not completely public with you because I can talk about things that I generally won't talk about in public yet because you guys understand things on a different level. Uh, but I was doing a session with someone and uh, Amelia Earhart was a person that had a soul who had come in and it, it wasn't the first time I've communicated with her. I've communicated with her many times on behalf of that client. The client has been a long-term client and um, this is a soul that pops in uh, periodically and you know over the years and years I've communicated with her frequently I don't communicate with her directly on my own because I, I don't have a personal connection with her but I will happily act as her conduit to my client anytime that she asks me to and it's been meaningful having um, the opportunity to be this conduit for her but I had a kind of a one of the most amazing experiences today, speaking to her. Um, we were talking about the metaphor in our death moment. And when we return home, it's, it's like our last opus. It's the last time we get to synthesize all that we have done and that which we have not done in this earth life. So we get one big last send off. And our moment of death and our method of death, it tells a tale. It, it packs a lot of energy into it. It packs a lot of metaphor into it. And there's nothing random about the experience at all. Even though some of us accelerate it and some of us try to stretch it out forever and some of us you know, forbid it, we're doing all this stuff. But when we actually do return home, the, the, the meaningful aspects are really worth investigating and interpreting because they're fascinating, the things that are embedded into them. And just a couple of uh, interesting stories here and there about how someone passes and how seemingly uh, parallel that moment was to like the whole entire story of their life makes it easier for us to digest what it is I'm talking about. For example, the crocodile hunter, you know, he spent his whole life in there with nature and wrestling things that most of us would only want to look at through glass or, you know, maybe in a picture book or on a screen. And here he's, you know, out there and doing all this stuff. And to have his return home be with a swordfish stinger through the heart, like there's really no way to explain that other than he embraced the unpredictable nature of wildlife and he didn't necessarily see a crocodile any more of a threat than he would a swordfish but because he was allowing himself to be in that kind of environment where he um where he had a tremendous amount of respect for animals and their nature and he didn't try to contain them and he didn't try to reform them or didn't try to adapt them to our way of being is why it was a meaningful passage for him 
for him to return home through an unexpected turn of what wildlife is really like. Because by nature, um, swordfish are not aggressive. So we would almost think that if he were to have a wildlife death, it would be at the hands or mouth of a crocodile and certainly not a swordfish. So that little twist at the end, it shows his gentle nature, but also his acceptance of the fact that nature is to be respected. Uh, but it was also a stingray. Didn't I say that? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Anne. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, stingray. My story makes zero sense unless it's a stingray. It was a stingray. Well, it made a little sense, but bad sense. Now it makes real sense. Thank you, Anne. I love that. Um, and, and so you can almost see how it, it, it just is so metaphoric. It's so metaphoric. His is an easier example for us to see. But if someone is, you know, has a stroke and they die, or they have a heart attack and they die, or, you know, they have um, COVID and they die, it's a little bit more difficult to see the metaphor embedded in it. But the metaphor is always there. It's just a matter of being willing and open-minded to interpret it if you would like to, if you find that it would give you some insights. I'm going to read here for a second. Okay, I'll catch up with the fires. And Amelia Earhart has been a guide of mine for a couple of years now. That's fascinating. And I was just at a wake earlier this afternoon. Geez. <laughs> well, I wonder whose guides I'm tuning into. No way. Wow. Freaky. Freaky cool. Huh. Okay. So I'm in the right place at the right time. So mind blowing, Christina is. Uh, gay wrote, that's so true. And thank you again for the stingray comment. Okay, so anyway, getting back to my story, I gotta reach over here for something because I always forget my little props, right? Um, okay, so anyway, so we're talking about four of our deaths um, on the phone today and, and uh, Amelia's in and we're chatting it up. Now, as I was communicating with her, just about earthly things and so on and so forth, I hear Amelia and she's saying something. Now, normally a hit comes as a hit and I can bank it. And then when I'm ready, I'll be like, oh, by the way, Amelia's here. And then I'll open it up. It's sort of like unzipping a file is how it feels. Okay. But this time in particular, I felt like I had to write down her exact words today because it was that... Um, stunning. And I did. And here's what she said. And you got to listen to this carefully. We're talking about our form of death and the metaphor. Okay. No one will find the pieces of me that I didn't want found. Now, what's really fascinating about that is when I got the words, I got the understanding of how that was so applicable to the client that I was talking with. And it made it clear to me that after all these years that she was guiding her, I would never be on the shadow of a doubt, ever have any question whatsoever about why she was guiding my client. The, the, that sentence just cemented it all for me. But what I was unaware of, which is really fascinating, is that after the fact, I discovered that Amelia Earhart had a tremendous need for privacy, a, a tremendous need for alone time. Um, she adapted to having a public persona because it suited her, because it gave her more liberty to be a female pilot and adventurer when it was really pretty unheard of. And in order to win her um, support and to win even the support for her journeying, it was important that she have some public personality. But what she put out there was not the true nature of who she was. She kept herself very, very private. The metaphor of her flying above the earth is since we always use up and down as a way to describe enlightenment or the hereafter, metaphorically, by being a pilot, 
and adventuring off the earth, what she was doing was she was metaphorically saying the earth level is definitely not at a high enough vibration for me. So in order for me to navigate being in my feet here, I have to rise above and I have to stay above the fray uh, for long periods of time. And I have to do whatever I have to do to carve out permission to do that. And that's how she navigated being a human being. Um, what came to my attention afterward was that she had actually written a prenup kind of letter to her husband. Um, this was a man who had proposed to her six times and she refused his proposals. And finally, she reluctantly agreed. But the prenup letter had some very specific uh, pieces of her truth in there and they were very private and it went something along like don't think that this ceremony is going to require you to have some kind of archaic form of faithfulness to me you know you be who you are and I'll be who I am and if we should find more pleasure in someone else in passing or permanently then we'll just you know let each other know uh, if you pull up the letter and you read it, it's absolutely magnificent about how it is a testament to no one will find the pieces of me that I didn't want found. I'm going to read the last line of her letter because I do have it, uh, but I think, I'm not sure, you probably will see me still, I'm not sure how Zoom works, but um, I'm going to look weird because I'm going to be like looking for something on my computer, but I'll try to do the right thing and keep talking. So uh, you don't think I totally disappeared. But let me um, find that letter. And I think you will find this fascinating too. Okay. So it goes, she, she wrote this beautifully. I kind of botched it all up already. But um, in one sentence, which is fascinating and a testament to that sentence that she gave me today. I must exact a cruel promise and that it is you will let me go in a year if we find no happiness together. And the line that I find absolutely amazing, I will try to do my best in every way and give you that part of me you know and seem to want. Like this is in the category of you can't make this stuff up. So I was glad that I was so motivated to take down her exact words without knowing her story. I knew she was a pilot. I knew she got lost on a flight. You know, I knew the normal stuff that you guys know, that we all know, but I didn't know any of these other details. And I think that it's a phenomenal illustration of what I'm talking about, the metaphor of death, the metaphor of our rebirth. There probably will be it'll be a very high bar for me to set to come up with a better metaphor that is a testament to one's life and then one's rebirth into the state of consciousness of our whole soul. Then her story of her life, the evidence of how she kept pieces to herself from almost everyone except seemingly one man. And then this sentence that I was given and how it was so appropriately metaphoric of her own death. And it's illuminating because when you use that as a jump off point for understanding life and death, it helps you to begin to see death as a celebration and not to see death as a loss. And I, that's my preference. Um, we, in our, um, my life, um, we had an uncle that passed this weekend and I'll tell you this story too, because it helps to illustrate it too. Now I know why we're talking about death, even though I didn't have a plan. I certainly didn't have a death plan, uh, but I, uh, so we had an uncle that passed a day or so ago and everybody has their struggles in life. And some people have more struggles than others. And some, you just have a sense that they didn't overcome them. And some, you see that the inability to overcome them, it is usually reflected in abuse of oneself or abuse of others, okay? And this particular person, I would say, um, without knowing it, he was 
uh, kind of abusive to others in a way that had, uh, from what I've seen, major repercussions. So I've always done my best to uh, be non-judgmental and understanding because I get the dominoes in one's life. I don't hold a, adults accountable for the damage that was done to them in their own childhoods unless they become aware and then they refuse to remedy it or find a pathway to awakening, then I think there's some accountability in there, but you can't be aware if you're completely unaware. So I wasn't holding him accountable for the choices that he made. But in order to navigate his life, one of the things that he did, he was a, um, a kind of, he was an out there guy, you know, big personality, big life, big, big, big everything. Uh, but he was also a swimmer. And he swam for decades and decades and decades, miles and miles and miles. Uh, it was, in my opinion, it was a way that he found the peace because even if you are unaware that you're carrying pain of childhood, you still have to get a break from it. You got to quiet your mind. You got to find something that makes you happy or something that turns over whatever left brain activity is going on and pressing you all the time. Uh, interestingly, again, a, a major illustration of this, this process is that um, he was found at the bottom of, his, of a pool. And so he, I feel like I don't even have to narrate this. I feel like I don't even have to add anything to it. The one thing I knew instantaneously when I heard of his death was I knew that he didn't die of drowning because that would be counter to the value of the testament that we are making metaphorically in our passage, but it was important for him to, um, you know, have an instantaneous death while in the water and then have the water embrace him and, and envelop him because it was the only place he felt peace. Where else was he going to die, right? Just as Crocodile Dundee, it was the place that he experienced peace with wildlife in their natural environment, not in, in a, an environment that he felt he needed to control. And so that's, you know, you could, you're probably booting up stories of your life and you're like, well, that makes a lot of sense now. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. To me, everyone's passage makes sense. Everyone's. There is no passage that doesn't make sense. Not at all. You might be like, oh my God, why? But for me, even your, oh my God, why makes sense to me whether I'm adding intuition into it or whether I knew something about that person, in either case, I'm able to put some of the pieces together to make sense of the story of one's life. And you think of it as like, here's the play and we're you know, acting the role and casting it and deciding what kind of novel it's gonna be in the story of our life. And at the final curtain, we get to do all of the deciding Every bit of it, we get to decide with no interference from anybody. And so it's the last punctuation mark that we get to express ourselves in a way that synthesizes the life together. I'm gonna to take one moment just to read something. Uh, all right, what she's stating is that she's had a lot of um, passages in her life for the last few years. And she doesn't really feel like talking about death all the time to other people. Uh, and I know that that, again, is something that other people would be, it would be hard for them to wrap their head around. Why can't you? It means you're hiding. It means you're uh, suppressing it. It means you're not dealing with your emotions and so on. I do think that the simple phrase of life is meant for the living I think that applies here. If you spend too much time focusing on death or focusing on grief or reiterating how many people have died or when they died or how they made you feel, you're actually choosing to put more focus into the thing that it is that was challenging to begin with. And that becomes a habit. You know, it's very easy to boot up those memories, especially when you can make a bigger story out of it just by the sequence and the frequency or the magnitude in a short period, it then becomes your story. You can pull that story out in six years. You can pull that story out in 60 years. 
and you're going to pull yourself back into that space. Uh, and that's a choice if you want to do that. There's a lot of reasons I don't talk about the specifics of my childhood. Um, only one of the reasons and not the most significant reason is because if I were to share with you the trauma that I experienced and all the different ways that I had trauma, I would be booting up the energy over and over again. And then once it became a part of my public story, there'd be plenty of people that had, and this was similar, or that was similar, and they'd need to talk about to reconcile their own similar experiences. So I've become, you know, the poster child for that issue and that issue and that issue and that issue, uh, which would be, I guess, wonderful for those who could get comfort in knowing that I have thrived after the experiences, but it's not the space that I want to live in. I don't choose to stay in the worst of my lifetime of experiences and relive them over and over and over again. I don't even find much, um, I don't find that I'm interested in telling kind of any of the bad stories from my childhood because it does bring me back to kind of remembering what it felt like. And since I've, you know, fully, regain my wholeness since then there's no work to be done by looking at it so why visit it if it's appropriate one-on-one -on -one with someone or in a, in a mild moment here and there of course i will but not to use as a tool of recognition where people can come to me because i'm the one that that happened to and the same is true about you here what you're talking about in the chat room is that uh, it's hard for people to understand why you don't want to talk about death. Um, life really is meant for the living. The soul understands everything we're doing when we are, um, when we fully returned home. And they're watching us and saying, you know, God, if I just still had one of my two hands, I would just slap you across the face right now because I want you to snap out of it. Enough, enough, enough. Get on with it. You know, like let's say you're 37 now. Guarantee when you're 47, you're going to be like, oh my God, how much time did I use up in that energy space? How much time did I use up? I remember those little things you find in like bathroom reading books and it says, how many seconds, how many, how many hours of your life do you spend um, sitting on the toilet or brushing your teeth or doing this? Well, how much time are you going to spend in an uncomfortable state of being because of this? People live and people die. People live and people are reborn. They're reborn into the state of consciousness from which they came. They are free and they are happy. Um, and you're allowed to grieve, but don't be unreasonable about it. Get on with it if you can. Don't live in that story. Don't make that your badge that somebody has died. In, in all of history, this is the period of time where we're experiencing the fewest deaths of loved ones. A lot of people don't recognize this, but the reason our mortality rate increases and has over hundreds and hundreds of years is not because we've learned how to live to 80 or 90 or 100. It's simply because when you average in the time of death, it's because we have less infant mortality and we have less childhood illness that takes death. So when you average all the numbers together, uh, the numbers were very, very small back then. But anyone that made it through those first three decades, they could go on to 80. It wasn't like, oh my God, he's 80. I thought you were supposed to expire by 59 because that's what the lifespan is. No, it's just you got through all of that other stuff. So we as individuals have all been here before. So we are very used to death. And then all of a sudden we come here and we're like, oh, what's this? I don't get it. Why? You know, back then it was like, it was a, a part of the landscape. It was part of our expectation. Yes, there were going to be some moments that seemed a little bit more startling than others. But for the most part, we, you know, we got up in the morning, we put our boots on, we put our clothes on and we plowed through and there was likely to be another death within that week anyway because that's the challenge of being alive hundreds of years ago and that's the peaceful part of that 
the acceptance part of it is where we have really moved away from. I was stunned in watching some of the, I didn't watch it, but listening to the way the world responds even to, you know, the viral period. And uh, it's amazing to me how I can't even imagine the percentage of the population that their singular goal right now is the preservation of physical life. We don't give a shit if you're happy. We don't give a shit if you have anxiety. We don't give a shit if you're depressed. We don't give a shit if any of that. The only thing we want to do is make sure that your heart is beating in your body. What if we lived again instead of feared death and shrank from death and preserved life away from death. If we live, we will stop dying. If we live, we will stop dying so much. Okay. What is it that's saying? If what you resist persists, right? So the more we are acting in preservation of the body and the heartbeat as the singular goal, the more we are resisting the death and the more we're actually pulling it to us, right? The more we are pulling our own death to us by having such an obsessive, obsessive compulsion to preserve the heart beating in the body instead of being obsessed with living, right? We should instead become obsessed with living that would change a lot for a lot of people if we became obsessed with living. It's a little bit like, you know, that I'm going to use female because there's mostly females here. So I'll use the female gender, but it's not to be offensive in any way, but we've all had like a, a female friend who, um, broke up with someone, right? And then all of a sudden, the texts and the calls and the emails and all that, it, it's like you, night and day, night and day. You wake up in the morning and you pick up your phone and there's like, oh my God, it's like a novel. And you know, she's sending you texts and she's telling you what you saw on, on Facebook and she's rethinking about wearing that black shirt. And it's like, oh my God. And you, you say this and you say that and you say this and you try to be a comfort and you try to show the benefits in it and you try to get her excited about doing something different and you know at some point you're like ah you know all of a sudden you see her name pop up and you're like oh no not home not home no nope, nothing to see here but then all of a sudden you go like three days and there's no word there's no text there's no phone call there's no email there's nothing you're like wow what happened and you're kind of like i wonder if I wonder if she's okay. And you find out that uh, she has a new boyfriend because all she really needed to do was stop that obsessive line of thought, get out there and live. And when you get out there and you live, all of a sudden the thing that you're making so enormous and so big, it shrinks down to size. It shrinks down to the proportion where it belongs. Now, all of this doesn't mean that we're not entitled to grieve we'll, you know, the breakup of a relationship or a, a surprising death or a death of someone close to us. It doesn't mean we don't have, we don't have the right to grieve or we don't have a need to grieve. It's, there's no doubt that having a really good understanding of our eternal nature and understanding the transformation in consciousness that that soul is still available to you it is still okay to say, you know, I miss this person. I miss the day-to-day -day stuff. I miss that this is the one that, you know, brought me pumpkin latte coffee when it came back to Starbucks. I miss that this is the one that always remembered my, the anniversary of the day I blah, 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 or those just little special moments or just driving my car. I always like to see him out there with his hose watering his lawn and weaving. So you're allowed to, grieve. Uh, the key is don't start adding up your grief moments and make your whole life about grief. And do realize that you have the power to say uh, there's, there's a reasonable amount 
of grief that's in proportion to our loss, uh, there's absolutely no need to extend that. There's no need to stretch that out. Um, we don't get any badges when we return home for feeling sad longer when someone dies. There are no badges. The only thing that we do get is while we are in that state here, we do get them saying, if I only had some hands right now, I would just shake you out of this and remind you of how gorgeous life is and how amazing you are. And I would just get you out there to live your life. Um, I want to catch up by reading something in the comments. When it, it's time that you choose to return home, you have said something cool. Can you talk about that? Um, how does one choose to go easily? I'm, I, I hope that makes sense. What I have a sense of, and I've had a sense of for a long time, that when I return home personally, I don't have the resistance that most people have to death anymore. Uh, I understand the transformation in consciousness because I do think when I'm way, 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 way away from my body and Karen is a memory, I do think that I basically had the equivalent of a return home. It's, um, I explain it as it's a near death without the trauma. So whenever I, I've had tons and tons of clients with, who had had near deaths and read plenty of stories as well, or been exposed to stories. So I can tell you that my experiences are very similar to the common themes that are in near death stories. Now the, cha the, the, the difference is that they come and they bounce back so they don't go all away, but I continue to, churn, uh, uh, to move down that corridor and I go all the way home. When I'm in the state of consciousness of being all the way home, I have a very full recollection of, um, of what it's like to cross over and to be there. So I don't have resistance to death or the death process. And as far as I am aware, I don't have any resistance to life and living either. And that gives a really harmonious balance between knowing when it's time to just hang up my hat and say, guys, it's been a great ride. I have absolutely loved it. High five to, you know, whomever I want to high five and kisses and hugs. I am going to go home and, you know, you can miss me because I'm fun to be around, but don't miss me so hard that you don't go on living your life. Cause trust me, you know, I will haunt you if you do that. Okay. And with this, I feel I can just literally let go of my body. I don't have any problem doing that. I don't think I need any big, earthly thing to launch me to go home. I just believe it's going to happen like that. And maybe that's one of the reasons why I'm less afraid to live than a lot of people are. Uh, and maybe some people think I'm foolish. Maybe some people think I'm a risk taker. Uh, maybe some people think I'm an idiot, uh, but I don't have fear. I don't have fear of germs. I don't have fear of planes going down. I don't have fear of um, uh, um, kind of like uh, toxins in the water when I'm in the ocean coming and eating my flesh. I'm cool. I don't have fears. And therefore, it's much easier for me to live. You know, the, I, <laughs> I didn't realize I love to like swim out in the ocean. And thanks to being way too young to see Jaws in a theater, um, when I'm out there and I'm all floaty, you know, way past the lifeguard line, I'm a little bit like, oh, should I really be moving my arms and legs that much? But I'm not afraid of dying. I'm just afraid of, you know, maybe something. <laughs> no, it's just a weird thought. It's not a real fear. I'm not going to not go into the water because of sharks. Okay. Um, so, yes, I think if people... I'm answering a question I should read it out loud. Is that when people die in their sleep? Yeah, I think when people are at peace with their life and at peace with the idea of, or not the idea, but the acceptance that we are eternal, I think those are the people who die in their sleep peacefully. I've witnessed thousands and thousands of deaths since I've been doing this. 
and every single death makes so much sense to me. Uh, and they don't have to be the kind of struggle that a lot of people are experiencing. They just don't have to be. You know, it's it's a fascinating journey. We see if somebody's online here, but somebody, one of the things is uh, she, and I'm sure she won't mind if I tell you the story and I, I won't use names, but uh, her mom was, I think in her nineties or something. And um, to say she was a curmudgeon is a really terrible understatement. Uh, this was just a bitter, 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 mean, bitter, bitter, brutally mean person her whole life. It wasn't something that came with age. And when someone's around like that, you're like, oh, all right, well, she's in her 70s. How much more do I have to put up with? Oh, she's in her 80s. How much more do I have to put up with? And then it's like 82, 83, 84, 85, 86. And it just goes on and on and on and on and on. And I don't remember her exact age, but it was something really big, like 96 or something. And what I knew from intuition is that she was going to stay around until she had some satisfaction of reconciliation about the life that she lived. And I, when it got to the point where, you know, she was supposed to be dying for like eight months and she still just wasn't dying. Everybody was just waiting for her to die for like eight months. It finally came in one day of how, my client could help her return home because there was really no need for her to continue keeping the heart beating, preservation of life in this body, just for the sake of preservation of life in this body. What it occurred to me intuitively was that she had done wrong by her kids. And there was one kid in particular that had a lot of struggle based on the parent that she was. And it was important that she hear that she was lovable from him. And so what we did, I'm okay with this. Um, we wrote a letter and pretended it came from her son. And um, she went to, she was at the hospital probably, I think like, you know, four hours a day or maybe even more than that, six hours a day. So the following morning after we wrote the letter, it was a Monday, she went to the hospital at her normal time and she had the courage because she understood the vibration behind the things that I had gotten from the guides. So she took the letter out and she read it and it was just, you know, you know, mom, I just want you to know that not even so much I forgive you, but that I always thought you did the best that you could. And I'm so appreciative of what you have given to me, that kind of thing. And so she read the letter and then um, she was a little bit uh, drained from the process of figuring out why her mom was holding on and drained from writing a letter and drained from reading the letter and all this. So she was just like, you know what? I think I'm just gonna, today, I'm just gonna go home for a little while and chill. And then I'll just come back and spend all my hours with her later. And so she drove home. And by the time she got home, her, her mother had passed. And it, it just goes to show you that it gives more insight into the process of life and death. If someone is hanging on and they're agonizing and there's no earthly reason for them to be staying in that body, then of course there's something that they need to reconcile their life. They need to know that their life had value or meaning. They need to know that they are lovable. They need to know that they're okay. And the other witness, uh, uh, other phenomenon I've witnessed a lot is um, not people who had to reconcile what they may unconsciously believe has brought harm to someone else, but uh, people who have no belief system in the afterlife, uh, no sense of peace in our eternal nature, no understanding or faith in what comes after we die. And so I've seen in those uh, particular people, I've seen uh, a ton of resistance to death. Again, the kind of thing where, you know, someone has to go in there and just kind of try to help that person let go. Oh, I'm getting the chills. Ooh. Big waves. Ah, 
my God, it's not even stopping. Hold on, people. I wonder who that came from. Uh, wow, okay. And um, on occasion, I've even been asked to um, go to somebody's bedside, sort of like think of it as like doing a session, but doing a session with the intention of allowing someone to have some sense of the afterlife or what comes next. And the way that I do it is just simply from intuition. There's no script. You can't script that out, but you just go into that space and you have a sense of what words would help that person to feel really good about this next journey, this next travel. And it, it, it's, it helps, you know, every single time, there's no doubt it helps every single time, regardless of what we believe the state of consciousness of the human being is, whether we think they're in a coma or we think that they're alert or we think that they're not, it, it, it's exactly um, helpful when someone doesn't have any faith in our eternal nature. Um, let me see if I, um, Joan, I'm just reading your comments too. That was so intuitive of you to explain to your dad that it's time and it's a magnificent, beautiful place and so on. I wonder if that's where I got the chills from. I wonder if it, wow, um, I'm looking up at the time. You wrote it 7.54 and I had that overwhelming amount of chills. I couldn't even stop the waves of chills and such a sense of love too, which no, these, I'm not crying. No, this is dust in my eyes, but I'm, you know, I'm sure that's not, uh, you know, I, I don't have any words. I'm sorry. I just don't have the words. Okay. We're good. I didn't have any intention of talking about this. So here we are. You guys ever see, you ever see like on certain TV shows where they, you know, they take uh, a word and it's at the beginning, you know, drama. And then all of a sudden the words, they get rewritten and they spell something different. And it's really cool how they redo those letters. And all of a sudden they, they scramble it up and it spells something cool and different. So what we're going to do is we're going to scramble up the letters of, um, of death and we're going to like rewrite it scrambled oh look i did it i just rewrote those exact letters and i re-scrambled it to just have like entire nothing to see here nothing to see here and i did it you see i took those exact letters and then i scrambled them and i came up with another word from those letters so there we are so now from this moment on we can actually see it for what it is which is a birth it's a birth of bringing ourselves back into the full consciousness of our eternal journey. And it's worth celebrating, even if you're sad in the loss of a person, and that's okay. It's still good to celebrate their birth moment for them and with them. Um, there's a question, is there a way to explain to others that you were celebrating their death in a good way, um, that I can live with it and accept it? Um, it's tricky. I, I think that the common phrases that people use, they're no longer meaningful enough to me, like he's in a better place. But you definitely can see how this is a time when religion had uh, great opportunities to gain a foothold because it did help us explain the thing that it is that we're, we're causing people to suffer. And by giving um, kind of legs to the eternal nature of our consciousness. It would give some peace to people who didn't have any firsthand sense of intuitive understanding of the passage. So some of the comforting things that come through different religions can, can be helpful for a lot of people. Um, but for me, I, my best approach is avoidance. So I don't, I don't spend a lot of time <laughs> with people who, <laughs> that sounds terrible. I don't spend a lot of time with people who are in new states of grief that are connected to someone I know, okay? It, um, I, the way I look at it is sometimes death can really be a circus, right? It's, there's a lot going on all the time. And I don't really see necessarily 
if I place my energy in there, uh, what am I adding? So let's let the circus die down and I'll be there to help them pick up the popcorn boxes and you know, all that stuff. All they got to do is just be in a state of calm because when they're in a state of calm is when anything I might say that comes from intuition can be of greater value. And this is in my, perf my personal life. Uh, life with clients is very, very different. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, never, I'll never be absent when you are experiencing something that you could use a boost in, okay? The problem for me is it's difficult to act as if when you're not there anymore and it takes way too much energy to explain 20 years of getting here to someone that is nowhere near there and they may never be there. So I'm not going to bring them to where I am. So I just feel like less is more. You say something meaningful, try to do something personal, uh, just try to keep it simple and, and just don't go over the top about it. That's all. Don't go over the top. There's so many things on this planet that people are just not ready to really move forward in. And that's part of being human is that we have to accept humanity for where they are. We can't fight that. We can't resist that. Uh, humanity has not as high of a level of awareness as we would like, but that is where they are. And it's okay to let them be where they are, knowing full well, that you're not gonna be the person that gives them all of the awakenings and awarenesses that they need to come to a better place where they, than where they are in the moment. Um, it's stepping back from the circus, similar to the pause we were all taking globally during the pandemic, waiting for the dust to settle. Wow. Uh, high five. I gotta look at your face when I uh, say this. High five. That, wow, that is really well said, but that is exactly it. I am not participating in the pandemic on any level. I'm simply an observer of it and an observer of the deconstructing process that was inevitable that we all knew we would be going through. So it is very, very good analogy. It is uh, very similar. We're walking away from the circus so that Earth can um, pull it some stuff apart and hopefully let new air get breathed into the stuff that's not working. But yeah, that's a great analogy. I like that analogy a lot. Very, very good. I'm going to go backward for one second because I know there was a question that I missed and I said I would get back to it. Um, what about the deaths that occur in situations such as the wildfires in the West? Um, it is very, very important to understand that even if we don't like the metaphor, there's always a metaphor in someone's death. And if someone is um, in the center of wildfires, and if they have a long story of whatever it is that they're holding on to, whether they don't trust people, or they think that people are reckless, or they think that people are uh, not preserving the heart beating in everyone else's body, preserving life. Uh, if they're carrying an energy that has anger or apathy or disappointment or anything, and that's a, a prominent aspect of how they put their focus, it's easier to magnetize in a return home that's caused by what we could define as recklessness. Okay, this is how magnets work. They get attracted to like vibrations. And such a person, if they do carry this anger or disappointment in humanity or recklessness or stupidity or ignorance or whatever they might be defining as the prominent feature of humanity or groups of people, uh, then they will magnetize in more um, result of others recklessness of course but then it also makes sense metaphorically that it would just be like burning up in flames okay most people who die in a fire they don't die of the fire they die of the smoke so you can almost see that smoke inhalation you can't get oxygen into your lungs because you're suffocating and if your worldview is that life is hard and people are disappointing 
and they can't be trusted or respected, then you are literally smothering yourself. And there's a lot of compassionate, well-meaning people who have a view that life is not good and people are not good. It doesn't make a person a bad person to live in that kind of fear or in that kind of disillusionment, especially a person who uses the television as a source of fuel for themselves because there's really no source on TV uh, that will be accurate in its understanding and reporting of what we're experiencing on Earth. It's going to give a person a very myopic view and therefore a pessimistic view of the course of humanity. And if someone's feeding that to themselves, they could be the most loving person in the world. Uh, and they could be someone that you adore and someone that you trust and someone that you'd, you know, hand your baby over to babysit. It doesn't mean that their belief system in humanity still doesn't create a magnetic energy for um, this kind of fear-based opportunity to come back to them. And the thing about death is it's about energy. It's not about whether you're a good person or a bad person, especially when you consider that there's no such thing as good or bad anyway. There's no such thing as right or wrong anyway. It's about the vibration of energy, the vibration of what we think, the vibration of what we feel, the vibration of what we believe, probably more important than any of the others. And then of course, the vibration of um, our actions and our inactions. So it, the universe doesn't lie and it doesn't tell a story different than an expression of the energy that you're putting out there. The universe mirrors and reflects back to us what we're putting out there because that's the universe's job. That's how the soul grows is to see a reflection of our conscious projection. When we see the reflection back in the echo, that's how we have our growth moment. We never get our first growth moment possibility at death ever. There are always, 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 always tons of opportunities for those growth moments long before our deaths. But if we walk away from them and we shut them out, then the big one might be, the finale might be the one that wakes you up. I wish I knew what you were talking about, Joan. What do you think about the new Healy device that is out? I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, yeah, I don't have any idea what you're talking about, but I don't, you know, I don't watch the news. I don't pay attention to, um, I could, I could literally go days without knowing anything that's going on in the world. And I don't have a problem doing that, but sometimes it really gets me out of touch with what is going on. Uh, so maybe somebody could explain and I'll get back to it. All right. It's already 10 after eight. And rather than take a break, I would love to just um, continue through. So really put your questions in there and we'll address more questions and anything else that comes up with this rebirth, we'll continue to talk about throughout the evening. Um, it is a magnetic energy, very interesting. It, it is used in healing. Um, I, I'm very clear that everything on this planet is created by vibration. Everything is vibrating, everything is a vibration. And the consciousness of our souls before we had an opportunity for physical manifestation is what created the vibration in the physical. But those thoughts that projected out to create the physical universe, they also are vibrating. They still are vibrations. And so I recognize that everything is on a energetic level. Everything is on a vibrational level. So I have a lot of faith in the possibility that things that can shift our energy can shift our relationship with healthfulness. What I would love to see is for us to discover that preservation of the body is not nearly as important as preservation of contact with the soulfulness within us all. Contact with our own soulfulness is the number one way to preserve the heartbeat in a physical body, period. Uh, I, we can talk about 
this form of health, this disease, this, that, this, all of this. But all of that disharmony is created because of separation from our soul. And the only reason we've separated from our soul to some degree or another is because of you know, mistreatment, misinformation, abuse, or neglect in childhood. You do not separate from your soul if you don't experience those things. It doesn't even have to be from a, um, from a primary caregiver or a parent. It could be just in general in this wacky, wacky world that we live in sometimes. Um, I have another question and it came in privately, so I'll just read it aloud. Oh, let me get back to yours. Isn't that kind of very interesting? Healing in a holistic manner. I love that. The do, one thing I will say about that, Joan, just to get back to yours and to finish the equation is um, body disharmonies, we can um, reharmonize symptoms. But if we don't reharmonize the discord that led to the symptoms in the first place, they will just be re experienced in another pathway of discord doesn't have to be in body disharmony but it could be in you know a flood a car accident um you know losing your job it depends on what you're experiencing in your life how that discord might come but reharmonizing the body it doesn't guarantee that the body will stay reharmonized unless the root cause behind the disharmony is fully made whole that's the only way that you'll have total resolution. Again, you know, sometimes we're just so connected to preserving the body that holds the heart, right? And we're not thinking about what does health mean? Health is a, it's a reflection of how connected we are to our soulfulness or not. That's basically what it is. It's, it's a reflector again. It's the physical reflection of where we are within the harmony of our mind and our body and our spirit. One of the reasons I'm so amazingly healthy is because I'm in harmony. My mind and my body and my spirit are in harmony. So I don't have to try things out through the body the way other people try things out through the body as much. I do on occasion little things, but I, I get the message very, very quickly and I'm able to bring in that reharmonization because I'm, I'm able to interpret the metaphor and find the benefit almost immediately. Oh, okay, Joan, this is supposed to do just that. I love it. I love it. Huh, interesting. Okay, so the private message was, what makes souls want to be reincarnated and come back? And this is something I think there's a lot of misinformation out there or a lot of information that is in contrast to what I channel. And this is my, my understanding of it, that with all the opportunities that we have to make discoveries, while we're in a body, it's understandable how most of us throughout history and most of us throughout any earth life, how it's really difficult for us to take advantage of that knock on the door from the universe and have the awakening that could come from it to discover the metaphor, discover the benefit, um, bring in the aha moment and then integrate that aha moment so it becomes a part of our being. It's not an easy process and it's one that uh, we fight, we resist, we avoid, we run from, but we truly just don't, for the most part, have the tools to do it anyway. And when we return home, we get to get the answers. We have an understanding of why we resisted the knock on the door. We get an understanding of how we um, pushed away an opportunity and how life would have been so different if we had opened up that door and kind of let it in and had some realizations or some opportunities with it. And so even though we have an understanding of what we uh, forewent, we don't necessarily have the ability to integrate it into our being as souls simply because we have the knowledge. It's the difference between reading a story in a book and then going out there and living that story. So if you live the story, you have a real frame of reference and it's a part of your being. But if you read the book, you're like, oh yeah, I get that. Or that reminds me of this. And so, yeah, I get that too. But I'm, I don't know why skiing is coming up in my mind when I'm talking about this, but I can read all the books in the world about skiing and with a really good author, I can perhaps mimic the sensation in my mind, but all I'm gonna do is parallel it to a moment in my life when I had a similar sensation, right? 
That doesn't mean that I've skied. And the same is true with when you postpone the recognition of the opportunities and the integration of those opportunities, when you postpone them until death, you write a good book about skiing, but you haven't actually skied. And what that leaves us with is that the soul has the, some, some interest, some curiosity in, in experiencing that integration in physical form when it becomes a part of our eternal being for forever. Uh, so by our own choice, we, we, we really think that if we come back, we're going to be the one to rise above the fray here. We're going to be the one to just, you know, sing songingly, be happy and connected and, you know, vibrating in a really high and happy space. We, we think we're going to be the one that, you know, can parallel with our soul's intention and this part of our quest and this part of our quest and this part of our quest and this. So, you know, it's a little bit like childbirth, you know, you, you get this beautiful little baby and you forget the labor and the same is true with reincarnation. You're like, ah, that life was so good. God, I loved it. I remember, do you remember that beautiful green dress I had? Because yeah, that's the thing you're going to be thinking about. But the memories are so good, you forget the pain. And so you get all excited about having another baby, you know, it's like, ah, this is going to be great. I'm going to be the one. I'm going to do it all natural. No epidural. I got this. I am the one. And then you leap in faith. And as soon as you land here, you're like, why do you think you cry when we're born? Right? Because you're like, oh, God, I forgot. <laughs> totally forgot. <laughs> but that's the reason. And we're reincarnating and choosing another life is always our choice. It's never forced upon us. I will tell you, having sat in many, many a pre-launch party for many, many a soul. And it, it's not that you guys haven't sat in each other's pre-launches or anyone's pre-launches. It's just that I remember them. You guys don't remember them. But having sat in and recalled, you know, um, so many of them, I can tell you that it, we, we sometimes kind of push a little bit because we also feel brilliantly optimistic about the result for you because we totally believe in you. But we got that whole rose colored glasses thing going on like you're the one you're the one you can do this you've got this here let me get one more thing to put in your backpack because this is the last thing and you're gonna soar so you know we are encouraged along the way which is why so many of us do it so often we leap over and over and over again and then we <laughs> we get to a point in this lifetime where we're like okay then they're done that if i ever ever suggest to any one of you again that I'm going to leap again. I demand that you hold onto my ankles and you tie me down and you do not <laughs> let me leap. No, I'm only kidding, only messing with you. If we decide that we uh, want to do it, we're going to do it and no one's going to stop us. And you know what? It's going to be perfect next time, I promise. Holy promise, it's going to be perfect. <laughs> uh, what fun okay okay so let's see uh oh yes i have an advanced intuition class coming up uh and oh you, you even wrote the dates oh my god that's the best oh you wrote two things all right i'm, I'm catching not up with you i'm catching back with you okay so let's do the first wednesday starting on wednesday october 7th um, three nights of advanced intuition. I, I have a lack of knowing what to title it, uh, but this is really uh, to help you guys become your own conduit to uh, universal wisdom and infinite truth. And not in your standard, a lot of you have taken my intuition development class. This is not your standard thing. This is going to be like um, the clinical trial after you've already taken all the coursework. So we want to get at it. And I think sometimes you can just get at it without needing all the pre-work. So if my course catalog says you have to have such and such a, as a prerequisite before we allow you into this course, just ignore it and join the course and we'll, we'll fly through it, okay? Just assume you can do it and we'll, we'll all do it together. We'll all figure it out together. You're going to have, uh, you're going to have homework. So uh, take the class. We're going to have a blast, but you are going to have homework. So be prepared for that. And then, oh yes, I have my next in-person event. It's in a, at a house in 
a private client home in Hampton Bays on September 26th. And the rain date is the 27th. We, if you are interested in social distancing or anything like that, we completely accommodate anybody's concerns. Uh, but this is a really awesome topic and probably the singular most important topic for the upcoming decade. So if you haven't figured it out yet, then I highly recommend that you be there. Let the sun shine in. Fear less, love more. Um, tons of brand new material for that. And it is, I think, the way to step through the gateway of 2020 into a future where you're prepared to navigate the new, um, the new world. Thank you, Susan. That was really, really nice of you. All right, cool. Um, I've had a very high, high, high talking day today. Uh, and I can start to feel it in my voice. I know I'm doing all that projecting thing that I'm not supposed to do when I'm on Zoom. So let me give you a minute to just put your questions in there so I can relax my voice for five seconds, okay? Okay, um, I have a long private message to read. So it's gonna take me a minute because it is pretty long. Uh, so anyone that wants to unmute and chat among yourselves for a moment, that would be perfectly awesome. Get a conversation going with you so I can read this. Okay, I am back. Enjoyed your conversation thoroughly though, everybody. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> uh, okay, so I, I read it and I'm just gonna give, paraphrase it in a short version of it. Obviously it was written privately, so I won't you know, say anything about exactly who it is. It, it's, it's a reiteration of a lot of the theme that we're familiar with where some, someone or some people that are closest to me are in such a negative state, it's becoming even more difficult to be near them. And maybe I could have been like pain tolerant for a couple of hours here and there. It's getting to the point where I'm not pain tolerant even for five minutes. Uh, I feel like a bad insert word here, friend, daughter, neighbor, lover, whatever. I feel like a bad whatever to this person or these people. And it's, it's common. You know, a uh, long time ago, I, I think I wrote an essay on um, what are the negative consequences of enlightenment because we only hear about the positive ones, but there are some that are a little bit difficult to manage. And this is definitely one of them. One of the byproducts of enlightenment is that it is difficult to be around people who are vibrating at the places where you used to be or even less than where you used to be. What I recognize is that this is the probably the greatest mantra that you can hold on to to help you navigate this is that self-love is the foundation for all success and happiness in life. Without loving yourself, you can't build anything that is sustainable. So when you have to choose love for someone else or love for yourself, remember if you give to them without giving to you, you will be living and building life on a faulty foundation so everything will crack. And if you keep remembering that over and over and over again, it helps you to choose you first. Never, um, selfish has become a bad word. It's never self-focused in disrespect to someone else if you are choosing you, even if they may be interpreting your actions as um, unloving or lacking in compassion or whatever other not so kind things they may think about you. I'll tell you one thing about enlightenment is as the 
process happened and my vibration changed so much, I found it easier and easier to throw myself under the bus. Because the ego is what keeps you connected to others' opinion of you. And when you become more enlightened, you have less concern about what other people think. So I didn't have any problem like making up a reason that they would judge about why I wouldn't participate in something or why I wouldn't do something. And I really didn't care. Uh, it's not that I didn't care. I didn't care in a negative way uh, because I understood that the preservation of my own peace and the preservation of loving myself and my choices and how I spent the precious thing called time was critical for my continued growth and my continued um, connection and being a conduit. So if they want to judge me uh, and, and that's the way that they feel better about my participation in their lives, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. At the end of the day, if I, if I had a thousand more hours to do what I love or be a value to people or make great contributions or just be at peace and a thousand less hours holding their hand when they have absolutely no interest in improving themselves or tapping into the value that I might be able to provide, then I'm really going to be glad that I spent those hours doing the stuff that mattered energetically rather than continuing to do the things that showed no benefit whatsoever. It takes four minutes or 10 minutes to let a person know that you care about them and you love them but it takes a thousand hours to try to bring them to the point that they can see things from a new angle if they're not willing to shift or change. And I, for one, don't wanna be that person unless I really feel that I can be of value to them to move past the story that they have become addicted to. Um, Again, anyone that's willing to open up an ear, open up their mind, or open up to a new possibility or a technique or just something different, great. But if you've already proven to me over 15 years that it's not you, then trust me. My door is shut, the light is on. All you gotta do is ring if you're ready for a change. But I'm not opening that door again until you do. And like I said, I don't have a, pe I don't have a problem with people judging me if self-love is the, the thing that floats my boat. Okay, you see what I missed because there's a lot of new messages here. Um, I, you know, I, I know I, I always communicate with you guys in terms of your own enlightenment. And I don't want you to ever think that that means that I expect you to be where I am. Yeah. Always think back. If you lived my life with me from the years 2005 through 2000, whatever, um, I really was doing like doctoral level work to get to where I am. If this is not something that I took lightly, this is not something I did as a hobby on the side. And if you are not where I am, it's not because you can't be there, it's just because you've had a lot of other things that were going on in your life, like maybe a job, you know, maybe a family, maybe all sorts of other things with moving parts. So you can't just take 100 hours a week and dedicate it toward this process. So uh, I, I know I put forth sometimes uh, a feeling of that you have unity with me where Maybe you're nonplussed about things going on in the world or that you're managing things better than perhaps you are. But what I feel is it's, I'd rather you have a place to be. When you hear those words that are soothing, it gives you another stepping stone to get there closer or an acceptance of letting that seed grow inside of you. But on the other hand, if you are struggling, if you are feeling disconnected, if you are feeling lonely, if you are feeling the repercussions of this final period, uh, you're not alone. Even high levels of awareness people are kind of, you know, been there, done that, and I'm over it. And I just, uh, I've had enough. I've had enough of it. And no matter how many times we give ourselves the narrative of why there's value in it, what's important about it, what's to come, what's to benefit, sometimes it's just coming all freaking tedious. And I'm ready to sit in a the movie theater and watch a movie. I'm ready to 
hug a stranger. You know, I'm, I'm just, you know, kind of ready. And I get that. So it's okay to be out of sorts. What I would re recommend is once in a while, you got to maybe boot up that energy that you had when there was a lot of newness in March and April. All of a sudden you're like, oh, maybe I'll learn French or maybe I'll uh, wake up and see the sunrise. That, that thing that allowed you to approach something really big and new, it's gotten stale. So just try to boot up some of that newness where you were thinking outside the box and you were willing to try things and willing to see the advantage in this time period. So if you are out of sorts or if you do feel lost, again, tap into that energy where um, the best thing in the world that you could do is just really try something new. And I'm talking about anything new. Even looking up a, an exotic fruit company in Miami and have them mail you six exotic fruits for 30 bucks and then find recipes and cook with them. When that fruit comes and you're looking up the recipes and then you're cooking them, it's so hard to be like, oh, this and oh, that, right? That's it, what I'm talking about. Living makes it so hard to be in chaos. Get in there and live. So try something new. Try anything new. Try anything new. I'll continue here. Um, is it normal to feel this way with the new energy that's coming in? Even though we have somewhat of an expectation of what the new energy will be like, what we don't have an understanding of is what that looks like for humanity's day-to-day -day experiences. And there's a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of space in between what we know is good to come and where we were, but inside that spot in the middle, since there's no direct link from going from here to there or what that would look like, it's like, oh my God, what is this gonna look like? And it's unsettling. It's very unsettling. What I realized more than ever is that our, the complexity of how we create life now with our numbers of bills and, and taxes and um, you know, internet and uh, there's so many complex moving parts that if we were in a circumstance where things were very, very simple and, you know, we rose with the sun and we picked the corn and we pet the sheep and all this, um, no matter what was going on on the big canvas of humanity, it would have very little impact on us directly. But now we can't necessarily go off the grid and get to that space of peace because there are so many moving parts that we've got to keep going. And so I recognize that it might be kind of fun to go off the grid altogether, but with so many moving pieces, um, we still have to operate within however the world is unfolding. But I do think that there's a little bit of excitement in being one of the people that adjust to the way the, you know, the way the chips fall, the chips fall where they may, right? It, it could be kind of fun to be the one that's stepping over the debris of the deconstruction and not tripping and not falling and not bumping your chin, but just kind of getting excited because you see new horizons because so much else has been stripped down and you have a vision oh look what we could do and we could do this and we could do that uh, and then as soon as we're allowed to kind of jump into that space and do things i definitely know that i for one will uh, make more opportunities available to be those people that are contributing our energy and our resources and our our wisdom and our intuition into those spaces where we are rebuilding because we don't want to leave those up to the people that destructed them right i'm going to continue to read wow i missed 14 messages now so i got some catching up to do people i'm not going to ask you to talk among yourselves because you've already failed at that miserably that there is no failure <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people are moving out of the city and making big life decisions. Um, and you're saying that yours is still in the city as the job is the same. Um, yeah, I could see that, that staying in the city, same job, same um, place that you're living could make you feel like 
you're not keeping up because everybody's changing around you and making big choices, but you feel like you're not making any big leaps. Um, what I think is, it's not that you are not making any big leaps. I just think that you're not in a rush to act for action's sake. Now, when we act in panic, sometimes we're not making the decisions that are right for us in the long run. And if you don't have an immediate cause to make a decision, then to take any action just for action's sake, especially a consequential one, is something that you could wind up regretting because you don't know where the world is gonna, um, where it's gonna settle after all this. And when it does settle, you may find that whether it's about real estate or it's about job opportunities, that in where we are going, there are new opportunities for you that you may have missed out on by being hasty in moving around and shaking things up just for the sake of shaking things up, okay? Okay, and I got a private message. You're welcome, I'm so glad. Um, Yes, your foundation cannot be faulty, and I love you too. There's a lot. Yeah, I'm going to read them first just so I can figure out like where to enter into. Okay. Oh, uh, there's a buzzing. Huh. Is it, is it, put your thumbs up if it's still there. Is it there? It's no. gone now. Oh, it's gone. Okay. So it's up for some. Oh, so if it's up for some and not for others, then I'm going to have to go with Gay and say it's just Thomas Edison messing with us again, honestly. Uh, I don't have any explanation for it. I really, really don't. I'm, I'm plugged in all the way to the computer to make sure that, you know, I have quality sound and I am hearing that some other people don't hear it. Okay. So... Thanks. Uh, are we allowed to call him Tommy? Uh, thanks for the visit, Tommy. It's good to hear from you as always. He is so omnipresent. He never disappears anymore at all. Um, okay, yes. Uh, it, yeah, when he was actually coming in on the, during the seminar that I did on the answers, the buzzing started. And ever since then, I've been having like a lot of electrical things where lights are pulsing and so on. And our, our power flickers a lot now and like there's all sorts of things and I, I don't know what it is I think he got a lot of attention while I was alive I don't understand why he's like so needy now you know what I mean it's like take a take a chill Tommy just settle down we're listening okay uh, let us get back to having full power man <laughs> now I, I I like his uh, omnipresence and just like we were talking about death and how everything is vibration. I think that when we are seeing things and experiencing things through electricity, it's one of the easiest ways for souls to contact us and to liberate us from any myopic view that life is only in the physical. And he's probably the most perfect metaphor since we associate him with electricity and you know, turning on the light bulb and all that. And for him to use that as a way to continually remind us of the really, really awesomeness that surrounds everything that it is that we're doing, <clears throat> even if we do become a little troubled by any one thing <clears throat> in particular, he's always there to remind us with the flicker of a light or a pulse that turns something on or off. He's always there to remind us that you know, get back to the big picture, get back to the big picture. It says, don't get too burnt out in the little tiny details because they're really just little tiny details. Uh, and I, I think back to some of the stuff I used to fret about, you know, back in the day. And the one helpful suggestion that a human being had said to me a long time ago, um, I don't even remember who it was, but it was decades ago, um, someone said to me, uh, it, 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 one year from now, will this be upsetting to you? And, uh, and I, have, I have to say that part of remembering to pay attention to the significant and to let go the insignificant is flashing forward a year and saying, you know what, I'm not even going to remember any of these details whatsoever. 
this is so trivial. This is so nonsensical. And um, I might figure out something to do to move it along. And even if I do absolutely nothing, I'm certainly not going to be thinking about it in a year. And that kind of letting go feeling and not thinking that everything is so consequential, it really helps. Um, I, you know, there's a couple of things in the backdrop of uh, this viral period that I did without knowing we were going to have this plant shutdown. What do you want to call it? Uh, planet shutdown. Okay. So um, planet shutdown. I, you know, I started growing plants from seeds in the house for the first time ever. This was in February. Um, uh, last summer, I guess it was, that we had had a long time ago, we had a little kitten born under our deck. And because she was born under our deck, we, I've always let her be indoor outdoor. So I never encouraged like birds to come around because that's kind of creepy, right? So I got, we got a hunter living here, but come, you know, kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. You know, you guys eat and then she eats and it's all good. So, but, uh, Andy is a little older now and she's, uh, she still hunts, you know, mice and little critters on the ground, but she doesn't hunt birds anymore. So I put up a bird feeder again and I've missed it. And in the last year, oh, I got that, you know, that hair, right? I got that one. It's so there. I don't know where it is. So, uh, so we put up a bird feeder and in a brief time, you know, especially it's a big hobby for my son too. I have seen, um, like 26 varieties of birds at that bird feeder. 26. And I'm sure it's higher now because I probably forgot to record a few. That's, that's, that's species. I'm not talking 26 birds. 26 birds I get, but 26 species. Now, if I tell you how much time I have spent being fascinated by watching those birds, watching them be born, watching them learn, watching them eat, watching their socialization behaviors, watching them figure stuff out based on their size or their color and, and just, just really just enjoying them. Um, I will never regret one second of the time I have spent with those birds. But if I had taken every one of those minutes and spent it with a negative person instead, where would my blood pressure be? What would my nights be like? How valuable would I be to you? How good of a conduit would I be? Hell no. Life is meant to be lived. Life is meant to be enjoyed. Life is meant to be appreciated. Okay? I can't emphasize that enough. If you're going to do one singular thing, uh, I hardly use the board at all, right? Except just the rearranging of those letters into a magnificent word. But if you were to do one thing, as a homework assignment between now and when I see you next. I'll see you next on October 9th, I believe, for the intuition class. Well, I know, no, I'll see you on September 26th for the fearless class. Do one thing and every single day from now until I see you again. One thing every day until I see you again. Can you all do that? I'm gonna look at all your faces and I'm gonna see Everybody raise their hand to commit to it before I even tell you what it is. One thing, okay? One thing, one thing, one thing. I'm committed. Okay, cool. Yeah, and I got you on recording. <laughs> uh, you're probably thinking what it is, right? There's a lot of letters in the alphabet I can start with that line, right? Um, not too many letters I can't start. I wouldn't start a G like that, for example. So I'm not going to tell you to gargle every day. Clearly, I'm definitely not going to tell you to gargle every day. Um, you can probably think of some others. There's no S I could possibly make. So you don't, you don't have to swim every day either. But what I would love to see you do, and your guides are going to ask you to do this very, very much, is... What's the next letter? 
every day you're committed. And because I have the power of talking to guides, every single person who watches this video for the rest of all of eternity has now committed to playing every day until they boot me up again. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, easy homework. And next time uh, I see you or I talk to you, let me know how you played because the more we share how easy it is to play, the easier it is to remember how to play in our own lives. Playing is so easy and it's so fun. Uh, and I will tell you that it's so easy and so fun because I, as an adult, when I started to communicate with guides, you know what I had to teach myself all over again? How to play. Yeah, I did not know how. I did not know how. I knew how to work. I knew how to, uh, I knew how to take care of stuff. I knew how to get things done. I knew how to, to achieve. I knew how to, I knew how to do all that, but I did not know how to play. And now I do know how to play, and it's one of my favorite things to do. And I do make a habit of playing on some level every single solitary day of my life. I do not let a day go by without playing, okay? And I'm going to call in a night a little bit early for not taking a break, but I'll spend the next 10 minutes sending you love anyway. Uh, I adore all of you. I think you guys are magnificent. I thank you to all of your guides. It was very, very clear how I was tapping into your guides tonight. Thanks for being with me, and I appreciate all of your support. Love you.